Well, hey, GBC family, uh, my name is Adam. I'm the executive pastor here, and I just want to welcome you to our virtual services this weekend. Thanks so much for joining with us. I want to make mention of a few quick announcements. First and foremost, just as a reminder, we are having live and in-person services on Sunday mornings at our Maple Road campus. Those take place at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. If you'd like to be a part of that, you simply can find that information and get registered for those services on the loop that goes out each week or at our website at grace Org. Also, I want to make mention that next Sunday, September the 6th, we will be celebrating communion together. We'll be doing that virtually as well as both the 9 and 11, serv 11 a.m. services here at the Maple Road campus. If you're going to be celebrating that with us virtually and would like us to provide the elements, we'd love to do that. Just swing by the Maple Road campus sometime during our office hours this coming week, and we will give you uh, those elements so you can be prepared to, to celebrate either individually or with your family or friends, whoever you're watching the services with uh, next Sunday on the 6th. Uh, looking ahead, I want to make note of the fact that we are also going to be adding a third service starting on Sunday, September the 13th, and that ser third service will take place here at the Maple Road campus at 5 p.m. So we'll have three services, 9, 11, and then 5 p.m., and we'd love for you to join us. If you've been waiting and just trying to save space for other people, there's no reason to do that anymore. We'll continue to keep an eye on our registrations, and as needed, we will continue to add services. So if you're able and feel comfortable to come and join us in person we would love for you to do that just make sure to sign up and get registered for those services again three services starting on September the 13th and then uh, lastly if you, if you have not signed up for uh, the loop which is our weekly e-newsletter that goes out um, it's got a lot of information really important stuff we'd love for you to register for that and to do so you just have to go to our website graceA2.org forward slash loop and you can make sure that you're getting up-to-date information on all the happenings at GBC Refuge here in the coming weeks and you hear this every week but we do believe that giving is an act of worship it's an act of sacrifice and we're so grateful for the generosity of of our church family during this crazy time as always uh, and if you feel led to give and called to give you can do that a couple different ways you can send your tithes and offerings to our Maple Road campus at 1300 South Maple Road here in Ann Arbor 48103 uh, or you can give online at graceA2.org forward slash give or therefugechurch.org forward slash give again thanks so much for joining us have a great day well hey there church uh, my name is Brantley. If we haven't met yet, I am the worship pastor here. And, you know, if you joined us last week on our online service, I talked a little bit about the importance of singing. I talked a, about this, this verse in Zephaniah um, that, that says that God sings over his people. And as we're made like our God that we know and love, we therefore are becoming a singing people. And so I just kind of wanted to extend on that just a little bit today um, with, with this other verse that I love from, from Psalm 139. It's a really famous psalm. And there's these, these couple of verses where the psalmist ask, asks these questions. He says to God, he says, where shall I go from your spirit and where shall I flee from your presence? And of course, the, the, the questions are rhetorical. Um, and, and he goes on to, you know, say, if I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed and shield, you are, you are there. On and on and on, he, he talks about how God is everywhere, everywhere present. Um, fancy word for that is, is omnipresent. But I, but I love the way the psalmist puts it with, with, with that poetry, with those questions. He, he reinforces that no matter where we go, God is there. And so, you know, that, that just connects specifically to this, you know, this struggle that we're in. Many of us um, going to church online, um, it's, I would imagine that it, it just is strange. It's, it's been even weird for me sometimes with, with my own family, um, even <laughs> watching myself on camera singing along. It's like, am I supposed to sing along or am I supposed to just sit here and watch? Um, it's just, it's just weird, but I, I want us to know and, and still press into singing together specifically because of that truth. 
no matter where we are, God hears our songs. Whether we are in a living room, in a car, um, it, it does not matter. On a mountaintop, in a valley, God is with us and he hears the songs that we sing and he enjoys them. I fully believe that he delights in them. And so ju I just again want to want to encourage you um, to really join me in these moments in singing. We're just going to sing a, a couple of simple songs and um, let's truly worship through song in in spirit and truth together no no matter where we're at i'm going to i'm going to pray for us just as we as we begin god um, you are so good to us you are uh, in all things you are before all things you are around all things god you are the alpha and the omega um God, we, we come to you today, wherever we are at, um, and, and we just thank you that you hear our songs, that you are the, the kind of God that, uh, that delights um, in songs. You're the kind of God that makes songs. You're the kind of God that inspires songs. And so, um, God, would we just be a, a people who, who sings of you? For all eternity, we want to sing of you. In your precious name we pray, amen.
God, we, uh, we bless you. We bless your name. Um, God, you are a God of blessing. Um, and so we just, we just bask in that today. Wherever we are at, we are in your, in your presence. Um, there is nowhere we could go um, that, that, you don't, um, that you don't follow, that you, you aren't already there. And so... Um, God, we, we just take this time to honor you and praise you and, and give you all glory. In your name, amen. When is the last time you felt lost? 
Although we didn't ever feel truly lost, there were definitely moments a few weeks back when we were backpacking in the UP where we wondered if we were on the right path. One evening, the most pronounced time where this feeling sort of overwhelmed us, we had come to the end of a very long hiking day. And we thought that our campsite was only gonna be about half of a mile from the trailhead. And so when we got ourselves ready, we figured we don't need very much time to do this before dark settles in. But then in a moment of examining our maps and examining our itinerary, we realized that our campsite was actually three and a half miles away from the trailhead. It was getting pretty dark, and so we quickly called every hotel we could find in a 50-mile radius, and they were all booked. And we realized we were just going to have to knuckle down and go for it. And that's what we did. We got to the parking lot where the trailhead was, we put on our gear, and we set out in the dark. Never before in my life, or certainly not any time recently, have I ever felt that sense of, are we on the right path like I did that night? We were with another family and we were regularly conferring between the two uh, sets of adults if we were doing the right thing or not. And there's a few times where the path was pretty muddy or there were ruts or there was a cliff edge where you could hear like Superior where we kept wondering, is this right or not? Now, I, we put Jason at the front because Jason had a great headlamp, a great map and a great sense of direction. And we put me at the very, very back of the line, apparently because I'm the most expendable in case of a cougar attack or something. But between the two of us, we kind of kept talking to everybody and talking about where we were, trying to make sure we were on the right road. Now, I had a couple feelings when I was out there. One feeling, a thought that just kept creeping into my mind was, if I take my flashlight and I look behind me, am I just gonna see the glowing eyes of creatures? And so I didn't want that. So every once in a while, I'll just sort of shine it back here, but I didn't wanna look and see. And then the other thought that I had was, I trust Jason and I believe we're headed the right direction, but I'm not totally sure. I, I, I think we're on the right path, but I don't know that we are. When's the last time that you felt a bit lost? Some of us, you, you hear the question about being a bit lost and you're thinking, right now, right now I feel kind of lost. I, I open up my Facebook feed, I look at the news, I see what's going on in the world and I don't know how to make heads or tails of it. I go to work every Monday and while I know what to do at work, I feel very little joy in being at work and I, and I keep wondering, what should I be doing next? Or maybe my marriage, my family life, it's just such a challenge. I don't know which end is up. I don't know how to go forward in this particular relationship. I am lost. Last week, we talked about who we really are. And the Apostle Peter was sharing with some young churches who they were. And he said, you are chosen by God. You, you are useful to God. You are treasured by God. He wants them to know exactly who they are. But then he begins to transition in the second half of chapter 2 and into chapter 3 to tell them exactly now what they should do as a result. I mean, go back just to that walking trail at night. I mean, if we were in the parking lot loading up our gear, ready to head out on our two-hour two uh, hike in the dark, you could grab me by the shoulders and say, Ty, you are chosen by God. You are useful to God. You are treasured by God. And I would say thank you. That is incredibly important for me to hear. That is, that is key for my life of faith. But do you know whether or not I'm supposed to go right or left at the first fork in the road? Do you know whether or not saying, hey bear, whether that's actually an effective strategy for keeping bear away? Do you know whether or not I should be holding some kind of stick on my shoulder to skewer any attacking cougars? Does that work? Do you know the way? I, I need to know who I am, but I also need some specific instructions for where exactly to go on this path. So when is the last time you felt a bit lost? We all need to know who we are in Christ. That's absolutely critical. But we also need to bring our situations before Christ and say, okay, now how am I supposed to approach this? Whether it's me in the government or me at work or me in my home, how am I supposed to handle this? The text we're gonna get into today is specifically 
centered in the home. And we're going to skip over this section and tell uh, the next few weeks about the government and slaves and masters and some of these other things in there. We're going to focus on the husbands and wives section. But in this section, Peter is trying to give them specific instructions so they know how to go. Now, a couple things before we get into the text, because there's a few verses in here or a few phrases that will kind of set off our modern ears and make us go, wait, what's that saying? So before we read those, I want to say this. First, the Bible has context. What I mean is we, we take this thing, 1 Peter, which is a letter, which was intended to be written to a group of people who are going through certain situations and read as a whole letter. And then we chunk it up into these little bits and try to read it out of the context. But the Bible has an important context. As Peter was talking to this particular church, those folks had maybe been living in Rome at one time and then this crazy emperor named Nero almost burned down Rome and then he blamed the Christians and then he crucified some Christians or burned some Christians rather and then he exiled some other Christians and so some of the people Peter's talking to may have been kicked out of Rome and are now living in a new land and they're going how do I deal with this government here some of the people Peter's talking to were actually slaves and they're like wait I'm free in Christ but what does that mean for me now where I'm still obligated to work for this master other people, uh, wives specifically, they lived in homes where their husbands may have had these gods, these pagan gods, all these idols. And these wives were expected to worship these other gods. And they were wondering, how am I supposed to be worshipful to Jesus, have only allegiance to Jesus, and yet I'm in this home where I'm treated essentially as a piece of property and he's some sort of king in my house. How am I supposed to interact with him? These scriptures have context. So when we look at these passages, we have to recognize there's a whole context here. Secondly, these scriptures have authority. They have authority. When we read the Bible, we have to think through and study what is the context of this passage. But we also need to recognize that we have a context. So when Peter talks about things, not only is he bringing their situation to the text, but then we bring our situation to the text. So when he talks about submitting to the government, we're like, wait a second, I've been given certain inalienable rights, so what does that mean for me? Or when he talks about how slaves ought to approach their masters, we're thinking, why didn't he just say all slavery is wrong? Why didn't he just do that? Or when he says, wives, you're supposed to submit, or you're, you're the weaker vessel, or something like that, we're like, wait a second, that doesn't feel right. But when we find something like that, we need to recognize the Bible has authority as the inspired word of God. That if there's something that feels off to us, we need to work extra hard to try to understand what the realities are that the scripture is teaching us. I've used this illustration a couple times, but imagine you go to the doctor's office, you have an appointment, and as part of that appointment, as you check in, you have to step on a scale. But you don't really pay attention because you see yourself in the mirror every day and you've weighed yourself before. And so you're just kind of looking around and then all of a sudden the nurse says, you are such and such pounds. And imagine that that number is vastly different than what you thought that number was going to be. What's the first thing you're going to do if you heard the nurse say you are such and such pounds? Well, you're going to, you're going to look at the scale for yourself. You're going to want to see what does this really say? And then if you see, wow, they actually said the right number, that number is very different than I thought, you'd be tempted to either think, well, that is reality and I have it wrong. Or you'd be tempted to think, well, I guess the scale's broken. The Bible's not broken. So, so if we hear something that goes, wait a second, my encouragement is look at it deeply for yourself, dive in, stare at it, and then recognize the Bible's not broken. It might be us that's broken, but we need to work that through. The Bible has the authority. With all that in mind, let's, let's skip a few verses in chapter 2, because like I said, we'll get to that later. If you are feeling lost, specifically in your marriage, if you're feeling lost, then let's let Peter speak into our marriage what it means to be Jesus followers in our homes. Here's what it says. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or, other, or the clothing that you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, 
which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the women as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Is that all clear? For those of you who are feeling a bit lost in your marriages, do you read that and you go, ah, there it is. Now I know exactly what to do. Well, hopefully, hopefully we do. But for some of us, that, that's kind of hard to untangle from their context and our context and really understand what, what it's saying. Well, the first thing we need to notice in this text is the very first word of 3 verse 1 and then the very first word in 3 verse 7. It's the same word, likewise and likewise. This word likewise is supposed to point us backwards. Likewise, wives, so wives, you're supposed to act like something or someone else. Likewise, husbands, you're supposed to act like someone or something else. You are supposed to be like someone. Well, well, what does the likewise point to? Well, the likewise points back to the key verse, which is 1 Peter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. We are to act like Jesus in everything. To follow in his steps, whether it's the way we respond to the government or the way slaves respond to masters or wives to husbands or husbands to wives. We are, it's WWJD time. What would Jesus do? We are to walk in Jesus' steps, to act just like Jesus. Now, there's a different kind of likewise that we often live by, and it's more of a conditional likewise. If my wife respects me and gives me honor, then likewise, I will respect her. If my husband is patient and understanding, then likewise, I will be patient and understanding with him. That's often the likewise that we employ in our marriages, but that's not what Peter's talking about. He's challenging us, regardless of what the government acts like or the masters act like, or in this case, the husbands and the wives act like, to act just like Jesus in our marriages. That's the whole key. Jesus is the example, the foundation of all of our lives. So if we are lost in any situation, including marriage, we are to follow him the end. But wait a second. What does it mean to act like Jesus in our marriage because Jesus was single. I mean, what, what would it even look like to be a wife like Jesus? Because we don't know very much about Jesus' family life, honestly. There's a couple little snapshots of him as a baby, him at 12, uh, him saying, who are my mother and brothers a little bit later. But there's very little in the Gospels about how Jesus got along with his family. So what does it mean for us in our homes to likewise Jesus, to be like Jesus? Well, first, before we get into marriage, I want to talk about being single like Jesus. Single like Jesus. Much of our culture tells us that romantic love, true love, is the greatest thing in the world, except for a nice MLT, mutton, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, right? Where the mutton's nice and lean and the tomatoes are ripe. They're so perky. I love that. Thank you, Miracle Max. So, I mean, we've seen that in all the movies, right? That true love, this romantic ideal of love, is the only way for a person to be whole to, to, to flourish, to be happy, to have joy, to have peace, all of that. We see it, it's like every movie, every book, every poem, every love song, it's all written to suggest that we need another romantic partner, another person to complete us. And yet that's not how the Bible talks at all about what it means to flourish, to have peace and joy. Yes, we are relational beings. Yes, there is romantic love in the Bible. Yes, there are marriages in the Bible. But if you read through the Bible, Think about many of the most significant heroes in the Bible. We know nothing about their marriages. They, they very well may have been single. Elijah was probably single. Jeremiah may have been single. John the Baptist seems to have been single. Paul happened, or seems to be single as well. And of course, Jesus was single. So, so any idea that in order to, to flourish, to thrive, to be ultimately satisfied, to have the good life, requires us to be married or have a romantic partner is wrong. It's just flat out wrong. There's only one true human, and that's 
Jesus, who truly flourished and had peace and joy and satisfaction in God and purpose and all of those things that we long for, that was all there in Jesus. So anything that tells us we have to have a marriage in order to be whole is wrong. Marital status does not define us. Jesus defines us. So if you are single, just a couple, just a couple quick things, and then we'll get into the wives and husbands specific. If you are single, when you come to text like this one, or you're listening to a sermon that's about marriage, instead of feeling like, oh, this isn't for me, or this isn't important, or I guess I'm not, no, 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 no stop that, stop. If anything, read this text and think, oh, I guess marriage is a lot of work. And then that's it. That, that's, what, that, that's all you need to be thinking. Not that you're less of a person. Think about Jesus and think marriage is work and you should be good. But the second thing I wanted to say to you, if you're single, is in this text, it's specifically talking about a husband and wife where one of them becomes a Jesus follower and the other is not. And those differences create a lot of tension and even suffering in the home that Peter then needs to speak into. When the faith of a husband and wife don't align, there's going to be tension and suffering because they're pulling in different directions. They are, in Bible vernacular, unequally yoked. They're trying to gain something different out of life. They want to raise their children differently or spend their money differently or move somewhere for different reasons. They're always pulling in a different direction because one is following Jesus and one is following, well, themselves or something or someone else. And so it causes a lot of tension in their scripture and tons of godly wisdom to back up the idea that you, as a Jesus follower, need to only marry other Jesus followers. So if you have a legitimate desire to be married if you're single as a single person, then you need to direct those desires in a legitimate way and not be foolish towards other people that are also followers of Jesus. Now I know that when I say that that if you're already kind of in love or relationship with somebody else who does not share your faith, that that's extremely difficult to hear. But, and my guess is that when I say that if you're a Jesus follower, you need to marry a Jesus follower, in the end, that for some of us, when we hear that, we think, well, my situation is different. Like, like he can say those blanket statements for everyone, but my situation is unique. Now, I don't know what your situation is, but here's what I'll say. Here's what I will invite you to. Reach out to me through email. Explain and share with me how your situation is unique. I'm happy to listen, and I'm happy to help you connect with another mature believer in Christ to talk through your situation specifically. I can be very comfortable in saying that Scripture is clear on this, but I I will happily listen to your situation and help uh, you navigate that. Because what I don't want is for any of us to be sprinting headlong towards tensions and suffering and some of the things that we see clearly even in this text we're going on. So if you're single, just, just hear that. Don't hear this sermon is not for you. And also don't let your uh, legitimate desire to be married drive you to foolish things. All right, let's get on to this wives part. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. What does it mean for a wife to approach her marriage in a Christ-like way. Like, like what does Peter say is specific to the wife that she is supposed to do at home? Specifically in this case, probably with a believing wife and an unbelieving husband. Well, he gives a couple of kind of phrases that again, for our modern ears, might kind of set us on edge and it might go, go, wait a second, is is a wife supposed to be passive and quiet and like some trophy for her husband? Like what, is this really? No, no, let's read what it says. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. Here's your Bible nerd moment of the day. Hupotasso. That is the Greek word for submit or to be subject to. And it was often used in a military sense where somebody would come under the leadership of someone else, where they would kind of place themselves uh, under the, the headship so that they could cooperate, that they could carry their own burden, that they could be part of what was going on, but that they could do it in an orderly way. In a non-military setting, this word hupotasso was about two equals come together and in order to make things work, one voluntarily yields to the other. They come alongside, they come underneath the other's leadership so that they can move forward and they can move together. That's what biblical submission is. Now, when we hear phrases like be subject or 
submission, wives submit, which is the, the phrase that it gives for wives in the Bible in the different sections that talk about husbands and wives. We hear weakness. Submission is about inferiority in our minds or it's about weakness. But that's not what Peter links it to here. He doesn't link submission to weakness. He links it to winning, to winning. That submission is a way to win the other person to Christ. It says, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. In a house with three sons, we tend to watch um, sports, survival shows, or movies where things blow up. That tends to be the things that we watch together as a family. We have never spent more than 12 seconds on the show Dancing with the Stars, so I'm far from an expert, but I do know how the show works. In the show Dancing with the Stars, there is one professional, very capable, gifted dancer, and then they take a star, an athlete, an actor, or whatever, and they come alongside, and then the, the, the dancer who puts together the choreography and trains this other person on the steps, they come together to work out a dance routine, and then they go dance in front of these judges. Well, I, I don't know exactly the ratio, but about half of the professional instructors are men, and maybe half are women. And so, in the case of the women who are professional dance instructors, they come and they have a male partner who comes. Now, this man doesn't know how to dance. Not really. He, he's not as fit as she is, is certainly in, in this realm. He is not capable of choreography to the same degree that she is capable. So if anything, she is his superior in this, in this case. But in order for them to win, she has to teach him not only how to dance, not only the choreography and all that stuff, not only get him in shape, but then she also has to find a way to let him lead so that she allows his strength to, to come along so that they can both flourish, so that he can lift her, so that he can twirl and spin and do all of these things for her, that he can lead in the competition, even though she's the one who's in so many ways more capable. And that's the way that they, most of the time anyway, as far as I know, that's how they perform for the judges in order to win. This is what Peter's talking about. Wives, even if you are the stronger faither, I know that's not a word, but even if you're much, much stronger, even if you're the only one who has faith and he doesn't, and you are totally tracking with Jesus, and he knows almost nothing about Jesus, okay, okay, then find a way to draw out his strength so that he might be won over to the cause of Christ. Be subject to him, not out of weakness or inferiority, but be subject because you want him to be won for Christ, that he may see your good deeds and respond to the good news. He also talks about beauty. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. The next thing that Peter talks about is, is fortunately something that we don't wrestle with anymore. I mean, apparently in the first century, Sometimes women were told that there was a certain standard of beauty that they had to live up to or else they weren't valuable in the world. And for, again, like we don't ever communicate to women their worth based on their beauty or anything, right? I mean, right? Well, at least for them. At least for them, there, there was this sense that women had to find their place in the world by looking a certain way. So when he says, don't let your adorning be with braiding and bracelets, he's not saying that if you're wearing a braid today or jewelry of some kind, that you are in sin. No, no, he's just trying to point them to the true purpose of their lives, which is to pursue Christ, and to point them to their true identities, which is to be valuable and worthy and beautiful in Christ. That what God finds as precious in a woman is her spirit, before him, that, that what's on the inside is truly more significant and precious than what is on the outside. When a little girl hears from her father that she's beautiful, when she's really little, she believes her dad. I mean, generally speaking, little girls, when their dad say, oh, you're so beautiful, they're like, I know. <laughs> and that, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And as that little girl grows up, her father sees that she is becoming, in all ways, physically, yeah, but emotionally and spiritually, she is becoming more beautiful, truly beautiful by the day. 
And yet there comes this point in most young women's lives when they transition from being little girls to being young women where their fathers might come to them and say, honey, you, you are more beautiful by the day. And they might say, oh, thanks, Dad. But inside, what they think is, he's just being nice. I know I'm not that beautiful. Why? Why do they struggle to believe that? Is it because the 13-year-old young lady is now wiser than her father? Is it because she understands what real beauty is and her dad doesn't? Is that why she struggles? Because she sees a clearer picture of reality than her father? No. She struggles because the world keeps telling her what real beauty is. Their world, just like our world, tells our women that they're only important and valuable and worthy if they put a lot of time in the gym and a lot of focus on their diets and they wear the right clothing and they won the genetic lottery. Stop listening to those lies. Hear the truth from your heavenly Father. A woman is precious and adored and, a beautiful, and beautiful because of what Christ is doing in her. That is what makes a woman truly precious. Look, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart and the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. So wives, be subject to your own husbands. Don't let your adorning be external, but internal. Here, here's a couple quick applications for, for the ladies among us. Number one, this is for all of, our, all of our ladies, single, younger, older, married, whatever. This is for all of us. Ladies, find ways or time to point out true beauty in one another. I'm calling on you to do this first. Now, I need, the men need to speak this into you as well, but, but ladies, call out true beauty in one another. Here's, here's what I see, okay? What I see is Instagram or Facebook or whatever, and I see women responding to other women saying things like, you're so beautiful, I hate you. Like, I don't even understand what that means, but, but like, you're so beautiful. Oh, no. and, and they're almost always talking about just the physical beauty there. And that's fine, and that's good, and I think it's important that, that ladies are speaking physical beauty to one another. But I also think, ladies, that it's a powerful thing if you speak true beauty into one another. What I see in you is more than your fashion sense or how hard you've been working out at the gym. What I see in you is this deep character. Do you notice who Peter points to as his example of true beauty? He picks a woman in her 90s. He picks Sarah of Sarah and Abe fame. She was the beautiful, who was truly beautiful because of her faithfulness. Yeah, yeah, she was strong at times. She was off base at times. But she trusted God. Ladies, point out the truth to each other about what true beauty is. Ladies, second, second bit of application for you is mind your mutters. Your mutters. Mind your mutters. What do I mean? Well, when Peter points to Sarah, he mentions how she called Abraham Lord. I don't think what he's saying is that, ladies, if you want to be true children of Sarah, you need to go right now and call your husbands uh, a Lord or something. It's, it's not a prescription for a phrase. He's pointing to this moment where Sarah is kind of hanging out in the tent and, and Abraham's talking to these angels and they start to give him this promise. And it says that she kind of in the other room mutters under her breath, is this even possible? I'm old and my Lord is blah, 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 blah. And that's the moment that Peter points to when she's kind of muttering, almost like she's struggling to believe this. But what he points to is that even in her muttering, she respected her husband. Is that true, wives of your mutters? That even in your mutters, it's respect towards your husband? Is that, is that the case? Mind your mutters. Can God speak to you and lead you through your husband? Mind your mutters. Third, invest more in your heart than in your bodies. Okay, here's what I mean. Just do a little math. I, I don't know. Do a little math. Ask yourself, how much time in a given day do I spend working out, uh, thinking through, planning my diet, uh, shopping or getting dressed? Let's just say that on one side. Versus how much time do I spend deeply 
investing in my heart and studying God's word and praying? Just, just ask yourself that question. And my challenge to us as an application, ladies, is to invest more in your heart than in your body, or at least to do the math to figure out where things are getting off. Wives, be like Jesus. Husbands, be like Jesus. Now, you might notice something here. Peter spends all of one verse talking to husbands, and there's a few more verses to the wives. And you might go, wait a second, why is that? Now listen, stop. Don't focus on the number of verses, but, but let's go back to the context again. The context into which Peter is speaking is such that husbands were told that their wives were essentially property, that the goal of the wife was to produce children for the husband. And if she was childless for 10 years, a husband could divorce her. And she was required to be faithful to the husband, and the husband was sort of nudged, yeah, you should be faithful, but it didn't actually matter if the husband was faithful back to the wife. Many Jewish men at that time would actually say a prayer thanking God every morning that they weren't a slave and that they weren't born a Gentile and that they weren't born as a woman. I mean, that's, that's how they viewed women. So it's a little bit more complicated in that situation to explain to the women, here's how you need to navigate this relationship with your husband who may not be a believer. That requires a few more words. With, with, with the husbands, it doesn't take as many words but it's probably far more dramatic, this one verse, which is like, Oof, you are not a God in your home. There is one God, and that is Jesus. Husbands, you are also called likewise, likewise to be like Jesus. Well, well what's specific? If, there's, if the women is specific about being subject and beautiful internally, what does it say specifically to men? Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. First thing he says is, be understanding. Jesus had taught the disciples to be understanding, to be compassionate, to, to serve one another. And Jesus actually spent a fair amount of time in the city of Capernaum, which is where Peter lived. My guess is Jesus was in Peter's house dozens of times. And Jesus saw how Peter responded to his wife. He saw if Peter was being dismissive or disparaging his wife in some way. Jesus saw what that relationship was like. And I wonder if Jesus ever said, Peter, come here. I just want to talk to you about something I saw in your home. Jesus didn't only teach the guys verbally that they needed to be understanding and compassionate and servant-hearted. He showed them. Certainly, he, he showed them by washing their feet, and certainly, even more so, he showed them by being obedient and serving by giving his life on the cross. And so Peter here knows better than anyone what it means to try to think through this being understanding and service orientation when he says, you ought to get a PhD in wifeology, trying to live in an understanding way with this woman that God has given you. You are to make it your quest to understand her. See, so many men want to get respect and get, I need you to understand me and respect me and honor me. And here Peter is talking about, no man, I want you to give what you would like to get. Live with them in an understanding way. Secondly, show honor to her as a precious co-heir. He says, show honor to your wife as the weaker vessel. Now, when you hear weaker vessel, especially if you're already sort of alerted to the word submission, you think, wait, is that about weakness? And then you hear this weaker vessel, it might feel like, no, no, stop. I, I think this means exactly what he's saying. Men, you are in all likelihood physically stronger than your wives. You live in a place that tells you you should always get your way and look out for yourself as number one. You can demand whatever you want and send her packing whenever you want. And he's saying, as someone who is equal to you, as a co-heir in Christ, you may be able to physically dominate your way to getting what you want, but don't do that. Show her honor. Take care of her as someone who is physically weaker than you, but is in every way a co-heir with you. You need to look out for her 
and take care of her as someone who is truly valuable and precious. She is a daughter of God, so be careful with her. Listen, we are always more careful with things that we treasure. If there is a $10,000 watch and a $10 watch, we treat those things differently. We treat the $10,000 watch with great care and we're gentle with it. If there's a $50,000 car versus a $500 rust bucket of a car, we treat those differently based on how valuable they are to us. And Peter says, live with her in an understanding way and then show her honor because she is so, so, so valuable. She is also a child of the Heavenly Father. Don't you dare mistreat the Heavenly Father's daughter and then go to him and ask for stuff. There's this really interesting warning here. It's like, don't even bother praying and asking God for things if you're not taking care of his daughter first. Because if you're not taking care of his daughter and then you go to him, he's going to say, go take care of my daughter first and then we can have a chat. And so men, live with your wives in an understanding way. Get a PhD in wifeology, and then show her honor as a precious co-heir. Some quick applications for us men. For This is for all of us men. Honor one another. Give another man honor this week. So not all men are exactly the same, obviously, but I know many men who are fairly competitive, trying to make their mark in this world. And they have no problem honoring maybe a grandfather, or maybe even a father, or kids or something, like, like showing them respect and encouragement. But when it comes to other equals or, or peers or even men who they work with that are younger than them or whatever, many men struggle to honor other men. And so my challenge for us as men, men who long for respect and honor, is to find a way this week to give respect and honor to another man who we're not related to. To go out of our way and just encourage them in Christ. That's, that's my first challenge to all of us men. My second challenge is this. Mind your eyes. Mind your eyes. We too need to reinforce for the women in our lives what true beauty is. Our wives need to be completely secure in the fact that we think they are beautiful. That our daughters and our nieces and our grandmothers know that we treasure their beauty that is far deeper than skin deep. That even if they're a 90-year-old Sarah, they are, can be the most beautiful woman in the world as Christ goes to work on them. And so we need to mind our eyes. We need to make sure that we are not looking at other versions of beauty out in the world and ever making our women feel insecure because they're trying to live up to some other standard. Make your passwords available to your spouse. Refuse to use your computer at times or your phone at times that might be dangerous to you. Get rid of certain friends on Facebook if they link stuff that's inappropriate or whatever. Just mind your eyes, men. Third, take your wife on a date. This week, husbands, take your wives on a date. Now, I am not great at being consistent with this. And certainly when our kids were young, this was particularly difficult. Now that the kids are getting a little older and they can stay home, we're like entering that sweet spot of being able to go on dates. But there's something really profound about me honoring my wife above my work, honoring my wife above my hobbies, honoring my wife above my phone and setting that stuff to the side and placing her in the seat of honor where she belongs. So this week, men, take your wives on a date. Now time out. Wives, you don't get to go, well, you're supposed to be spontaneous and the pastor said stop that. Just give some good dates, work it out, and go on a date this week so that your wives know that you honor and love them. We all at times can feel lost. Certainly this is true in these sort of strange dark days and it can be true in our marriages. And when we start talking about marriage, I had like, a much, much, much longer sermon that had to cut down to fit into a reasonable amount of time. There's so many application points. But let's, let's remember what Jesus would do. Let, let, let's, let's look back at the key verse, 1 Peter 2.21, For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. What would Jesus do? This is always a good principle. But if you are struggling with knowing exactly what Jesus would do, then simply WWJD, so a different WWJD, watch what Jesus does. Well, what would Jesus do? Well, watch what he does. 
Look at the scriptures and just watch exactly what Jesus does. Was Jesus submissive? Did Jesus, was he equal with the Father? Yes. And yet did he find a way to come under the leadership of the Father even to death on the cross so that others might be one? Well, yeah. Was Jesus attractive physically? And it's kind of a weird question, right? But was he? Was he? We actually have no idea what Jesus looked like. Isn't that fascinating? There's only one verse that even remotely points to what Jesus may have looked like. That was in Isaiah 53. And it says, He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. So what did he look like? We don't know, but it doesn't seem like physical beauty was what made Jesus truly beautiful. Did Jesus deserve honor? Well, yeah, all, all glory and all honor and all power due to Jesus. And yet, what did Jesus do? In the very likeness of God, he, he came down and lived among us and treated others more highly than himself. He gave honor to us when we were enemies of his. Listen, no one is more honorable, more beautiful, more loving than Jesus. What would Jesus do? Sometimes it's hard to navigate, but watch what Jesus did. And then likewise, go into your marriages. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Peter's words here. I thank you that Peter, although this is thousands of years ago in a very different place, that he was wrestling with many of the same things that we wrestle. That, that, that their culture was struggling with many of the same temptations and idols that our culture struggles. God, I, I thank you that when he spoke, he wasn't just giving, hey, here's some ideas, but he was saying, I walked with Jesus inspired by the Holy Spirit. Likewise, likewise, let's walk with Jesus. Do what he did as we watch what Jesus does. God, this week as we whether we're single or married, as we approach this subject of marriage, could we do it in a way that gives you all glory and all honor and all respect and rests in the truth of who you are and what you're calling us to in this life. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.